pleasure you know I, i've spoken to joe lovano and uh, i have a interview scheduled with gary smullian and cameron brown so it's it's almost like i'm, I'm getting the joe lovano no net together <laughs> oh, okay is that just a coincidence or, or yeah is that yeah coincidence, coincidence. I, i just checked the, the record uh, the 52nd street uh, themes the other day and i was like wait a second i'm like it, it, this is yeah, that's the <laughs> first one that we did That's yeah. the first one we did, and then I think two or three since then, maybe at least two, at least that I can remember. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that was the very first one, though. Yeah, I, I, I would love to to talk a little bit later also about Joe and your connection with him. But like we said, I, I just want to start first with your latest album, Nascentia. Uh-huh. Uh, I listened to it, and I listened also to the small stream you guys did. You know, Smalls has 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 the streams. Oh, cool. And yeah. it's basically, you know, like, well, it's like 30% like being on a concert, I put it like that. Yeah, but, yeah. It's but at a, least they, you get the band. Yeah, experience. and they do a pretty good, the, the recording is pretty good, you know, it, it, it seems like the quality is good. And yeah. I guess that one was like, as I recall, that one was like to to no audience, right? The, yeah, the it was, yeah, 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 yeah. But still, it's like, you know... Just to see the band playing, the hats and everything, you know, I love that. That's what jazz is all about, I guess. You know? Yeah, yeah. In a in a way, I enjoyed it. Um, it's the first time I'd done it without, you know, the place is usually like really crowded, and yeah. so that was the first time I played there. You know, where it's like nobody there. You know, it's bizarre. Way it was kind of more relaxed. You know, yeah. at least I don't. You know, the music. I don't know whether it was. Would be that much affected by it but just the leading a band was a lot easier because there were no people to be <laughs> running into and, and waitresses to bump into or yeah. or you know th- things like that you know yeah i agree yeah no but still like beautiful to, to see you guys the energy you have also the record i mean you know you you wrote amazing music like really uh, oh, thank you thank you really i just have a new one. Oh, really thanks man Yeah, we just um, just went into production. You know, it's just being printed this month, and then it won't be out till officially till February of twenty um, two, and um, it's the newest record. You know, which will come out. You know, about a year after this one did, and because um, yeah. this one came out in about April, yeah. this will come out a little bit earlier because with all the pandemic and everything, it's like been um, something I've I've my producer wanted me to do and i spent like since the middle of the summer working on it because it's um uh, a, a project that i did of all ballads so it's a ballads record oh, wow. but it's not your typical ballads record because i have um uh orchestra um uh orchestrations by richard sussman a great um mm-hmm. great guy that i collaborated with and also randy brecker is is uh, oh, wow. guest on trumpet on several cuts so it's like a, a kind of a, a different outlook on a ballads record but it's it's uh uh oh, you know for all what i wanted to do is a record where which i really haven't done before where the the whole mood of the record is pretty much you know uh you know kind of quietude for the whole record um in 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 the sense that um uh You know, sometimes you do a record and you have a couple ballads or you have yeah. one ballad on a record and then you have one like this burner and you have one that's this and one that's that. And sure. that that's the average record, you know, um, of any kind of music. And so when you kind of put the parameters on it, that's going to be all um, ballads or, or um, you know, peaceful songs or mm-hmm. quiet songs, love songs, whatever you want to call it. I mean um uh it all comes out of that and and i i'm happy to do that because i haven't really ever done that myself on my own record you know and i like other people's records that are like that because yeah. when you put it on you kind of know what you're getting into for an hour rather than you know up and down and this and that you know so um 
so it came out really great. I'm, I'm really happy with it. It took a lot of work because it's it, some of my originals, but I also chose really carefully other people's songs. And so oh, I do. What, what are they? I, well, I do a real unusual Duke Ellington song from the Queen's Suite. Uh, let's that's called Le Secour Velour. It's um, I don't know this one. Um, yeah, it's uh, on the Queen's Suite and. It's done as an ensemble, and I make it an alto feature. It sounds like it's a Johnny Hodges feature, but it, but okay. it isn't really on the record. It's a full um, sax section thing. And then I do, um, I do, I open the record with bl blue and green, just with alto and orchestration. Like, oh you know, man, like beautiful orchestra and alto. So it's really a different take on blue and green. It's not like, you know, a re rehash or re uh, retro yeah. look on it uh, i would never really feel any reason to do that and um let me see what else other people say i do a also a very unknown stevie wonder song that wow. he didn't really release on a record um it's a theme song from a movie he did um uh, a while back a decade ago or so and uh, it's it's a great ballad. Like wow. he, he wow. really writes some great ballads. I don't know if anyone's recorded it. It's it's called "Kiss Loneliness Goodbye," mm. and it's <laughs> a, a real serious love ballad. And um, I do that. And 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 um, I don't know that anyone's recorded it. I took it off of the movie sound. Wow, amazing! Yeah, I just transcribed. Good choice. It yeah, and. Uh, let me see a couple a couple other you know semi unknown i do you know different takes different ways of doing some ballads and um you know i'll i'll, I'll, I'll leave it to your surprise when you first uh, super it. yeah it's, super it's definitely different and um randy brecker really contributed incredibly i've i you know i've known randy pretty much since i've been in new york and then we recorded quite a few records with the yeah. Mingus Big Band and we're on the road with the Mingus Big Band for years during the really the probably the best incarnation of the band was the one when Randy uh, was there and and um, and the other guys that were there with him at that time. This would be like mid 90s, you know, oh, like yeah. mid, mid to 90s to the to the beginning of the of 2000, you know, so but for that six or seven years. Um, and and so we, we played together a lot, but he's never played on my record, you know. Yeah, yeah. So I was glad I could get him um and to play ballads. That's gonna be yeah. fun to hear and, Randy. And and so then once I knew that I had Randy, I I wrote, you know, once I knew that the date was set, like it was a, you know, a month away, and I said, Man, I got Randy Brecker, I gotta write one burner. And so really it's like nine ballads and then a pause the end of the record and oh, wow. I wrote this one one burner song for me and randy to burn out on like that it's almost like a preview of coming attractions you know like on a movie where you go like the next adventure will be you know and and so that one um at first i was like you know i said it to people they said well how are you going to fit that into a ballads record but it's really like i, I do nine songs that are all you know, ballads. And then there's a kind of, I had the engineer, the mastering engineer do like a kind of a longer than usual pause. So if, you, if you're having quiet, you know, wine candle at dinner, you can just turn the record off then because the next one is going to shake you up a little bit, you know, the last one, you know. So I, I, I could have called the record nine ballads and a burner, but I <laughs> That's thought a that, good that might be, I, uh, in the liner notes, I think um, I, this guy from the Jazz Times wrote the liner notes and, and he did use that phrase for the liner notes, but I didn't title it that. It, no, no, uh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's cool, man. That, that's, like you said, that's a prequel to, you know. Exactly. Because, I, you know, I also thought, you know, Randy to me is, is, you know, not only beautiful tone and a fantastic yeah. lyrical player, but he's also a burner and he's still, you know, he's older than me and yet he's like in, in he's my elder in that sense, you know, and Michael was a couple of years older than me too, but, mm. but um, uh, Randy is still at the, at the height of his powers. I mean, he can still just go yeah. up there in that, in that stratosphere on the trumpet and just really burn out. And so I had to, I thought if I got him in the studio, I got to at least do that. And we did it in like one take. I sure. Mean, yeah. It was, it, it, it was, 
the the song's a little difficult, but I gave it to to. I mean, it's difficult, like in that it's kind of fast. But um, I gave it to Randy ahead of time, and there was no problem. I mean, we. we and this just, one is without orchestra, like the the. No, there, yeah, there's three songs with an orchestra, and on on those three songs, the rest of the band doesn't play. Okay. Ah, uh, oh, okay. Things, saxophone and orchestra, and wow. it really sounds full because the um. The, uh, the arranger R Richard Sussman, you know, created like, you know, he's kind of like um, in the line of Zos Joe's Allen, all like can get mm. like, oh, like, gigantic, huge sounds on, on with both orchestra sounds and synth sounds that it just sounds, it sounds enormous, you know, um, and sounds real too, because they're all like sampled strings and everything. So, it's, you know, of course, I'd love to have had the London Perfect. Philharmonic and him on synthesizer as well, you know, <laughs> but uh, it's, I would say it's as close to the real thing as, as you're going to get in that sense. And, and um, I guess a, a lot easier and prone to not having any problems. I mean, yeah. it's just me and him really that, that worked on this and we worked on it quite a bit. But still, it's only two instead of you know two hundred or or whatever fifty people you know. So, yeah. so it was it was it worked out really well. I I think he can he and Randy both contributed great to the record, and then um, the rest is my quartet, the, the same one I think that you saw it um, with Jason and Ugona and yeah, Bruce yeah. and Ugona and Bruce Barth. Yeah, oh, beautiful! Which, wow. which is really my working quartet, you know. Yeah. So we're pretty used to playing together. And I, you know, I'm, I think Bruce also um, really played his ass off on, on this. And Bruce and is was, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, he's such a player. Yeah, yeah, fantastic piano player, you know. How, how long have you played with these guys? It's like... Well, you know, Jason and I met him almost as soon as he came to town. He's fairly new, you know, he's 40-something yeah. years old and he's been in town maybe six or seven years. And I met him right away at a jam session. And we started playing, you know, after that pretty regularly. So I'd say for five or six years, we've oh. been playing together, you know, regularly. And then him and Ugana are real tight, like as bass and drums. So that was kind of a no brainer. And then Bruce was um, always a piano player I wanted to play with, but haven't, you know, we haven't done records together um, until I started calling him for my records. I, I've always liked him and, you know, um, it just worked out so well from the first record that I knew on this one that he would be the guy to call and luckily he could make it. I mean, there's a few good piano players I like, but I, I'm, I'm kind of particular about that because I don't, I don't like a piano player that takes over and kind of overplays, you know, which some even good piano players tend to, to me like overplay a little bit because the instrument is, is, um, is that way you got 88 keys and <laughs> you guys want to play all 88 of them in one song you know uh, if you know what i mean yeah he's a team player i mean like when i listen yeah, to yeah and, really and like less it. is more he also um yeah. you know doesn't his comping is great but it's not over comping you know i even noticed that with randy who he hadn't played with as much as I have and, and yet he just naturally doesn't over comp for Randy he listens to what yeah. what everybody's playing and reacts rather than the other way around you know yeah you know, that's so. important yeah to have yeah yeah like I noticed that when I Nascenti also I mean also another thing I was like you and Jeremy felt well thank you yeah. man you, you sound like you know speaking about trumpets like you you sound tight as you know yeah i like, i really you know during that period of time jeremy and i had been talking because we we're both not, not that busy and um um you know i was really glad that that um we could hook up also him and clark gate and yeah exactly yeah. so the, the three horns were really like uh you know, already hooked up, even though we hadn't done a gig, you know, uh, it, it sounded like we had, and, yeah, uh, definitely. and everybody was compatible and, and, and also into the spirit of, of, of playing because boy, you know, in New York, it's been, I think everywhere, but it's been, I mean, literally there were no studios open when I did Nascentia. There were, none of the New York studios were open. Um, oh, really? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, almost 95% of them were closed at that time. <laughs> so 
I luckily got this studio, Sears Sound, which is one of the bigger studios in New York, but it's also one of the most open. It's like a 5,000 square foot studio, which is real unusual in New York. Um, that's huge. You know, that's yeah. almost an entire building, you know, uh, floor, you know. And um, it had real high ceilings and windows and everything. So there was no, they didn't have to close. Like a lot of smaller studios actually had to close, you know, like were forced yeah. to close by the city. Um, you couldn't be open. And so they, because of their size, weren't forced to close. And so that was kind of, you know, lucky. And it also ended up getting, uh, being really conducive to get a great sound for that record. So it was a blessing in disguise in a way, but also it was for a while, I was like, where are we going to record? Because, you know, the first places that I called that I knew of were all closed, you know, and it was a little, a little freaky because not only was there no live music, there was no recording, you know, very little except maybe yeah. people at, at home studios and, you know, really smaller places that wouldn't have fit that band, you know, yeah. uh, you know, like home studios and stuff. But any of the actual business studios were forced to be closed because yeah. they're, they didn't have there. ventilation and they like anything else like restaurants or anything they were just not allowed to be open if if in fact they were open they could have been fined like a huge amount if it was found out you know which it would be because you'd be yeah. reach the record and even if they find them six months later it wouldn't be pretty you know so it was just it was a blessing that that um we were able to get that in the best possible way and that that wasn't the case with this last recording because things have opened up and we did yeah, it in, in September and by September most most places were opened up and I, I could do it at the studio that I always have liked the most which is called Trading Eights with my my uh, engineer Chris Sullet who was the engineer on on um, Nascentia too because he went to the Sears Sound and he knew the board there too but he has his own studio he calls it Trading Eights and it's great it's it's not big enough for a big band but mm, it's yeah. big, enough, big enough for like you know three horns and 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 a rhythm section and everything you know it's it's big yeah. and um and uh he's got a great piano and that's, so we could do we did it there you know yeah that's beautiful and how did you like uh, writing like you know for you jeremy and clark and even like the rest of the tunes that are quartet like you know new note and i don't know Agama, yeah. it's like a, a amazing burner. Talking of burners, like right. the, the unison ones you guys play. Like, how did you approach since writing for this record? Like, because like Corona cool. already hit, right? Or right? no, it didn't. No, it did. Yeah, um, of course. Most most of the songs weren't written until like the pandemic. I wrote most yeah. of them over the pandemic, except for maybe one. And then the Brit, uh, I, I remember Brit, of course, was written uh, for Lee Morgan's band yeah. by Harold Mayburn, who had just passed away like the little while before this. And so um, I really wanted to do that, not only in honor of, uh, of Harold Mayburn, but also because I really liked the song and, and, and all. And, and um, the other ones I wrote, like the suite I wrote, you know, during the pandemic. And um, mm -hmm. it started with the, with the song Nascentia. And then I built like a suite around that. And each song was different. So to answer your question, it's just like, each song is kind of like a personality in itself and you work you you work with it like to um <clears throat> to make it um the best arrangement or the best um uh fit for for instance on new note it it fit to just have two horns and not three yeah. the other ones for three horns i i fit it in so that there's a drum and bass interlude in between you know uh that that really kind of kind of connect each yeah. song also, two of them are in the same key, too. So the one ends and then the other has got a bass interlude that, you know, goes into different keys, but it ends up coming back to the, the key of F. It's a um, sweet thing. So. Yeah, so it gives it a... It just ended up, you know, working out as a suite really well. And at first I was going to start the, the record with that suite, but then the first song we released was... Um, the second song that I wrote during the pandemic. So it's a beautiful it was, melody. It's such it's a beautiful melody. That, um, it made me feel good. You know, I got to yeah. say it, it really, I, in a way it's selfish, like in the sense of during some of those darkest times, which was 
more than a year ago, in other words, the spring of 2019, were some pretty pretty dark times, you know. Um, and and so that song I would play um, for myself here, you know, at my apartment in New York City, just because the the, the melody and the feeling of the song yeah. made me feel uplifted. And then I played it a couple of times with Jason Tiemann creating a a drum, his own drum, because uh, I didn't really write like what the drum should play. Sure. I just played played him the melody and then he created a drum part that made it even better. In fact, one guy that listened to it said like, how many drummers do you have on that cut? You know, because he's playing so much stuff on that it's one. It's a jungle, cut. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so that, that song, I, I just, I felt like I had to open the record with that because it's the most positive, like in another, Another another time period, you know, maybe I wouldn't have, but I felt like you know I and and the world needed something to like That's start good. really positively, you know, um, and and I kind of thought by the time the record would come out, we'd be already through with all this. But to be honest with you, it's still it's still not completely through. I mean, no. uh, I mean with all the you know uh, no. booster shots and. I have an 11 year old daughter and she's now just getting an appointment for a shot. And, you know, I'm a little bit, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, you know, I'm definitely pro vaccination, but I'm a little bit, you know, have trepidation about an 11 year old getting I agree. a yeah. heavy shot. You know, um, I think it'll be okay. She'll actually be 12 by the time she gets it. Cause her birthday is in a week or so. So she'll be 12 and, She's strong, and so in the end, I would rather, even if she does have a slight reaction, I'd much rather that than her get like sure. days yeah. of sure. this um, of this f flu or whatever the hell it is. Uh, it's really hard to think about. Like like now, you think way back, and you go like, yeah, you know, it was the first news reports were in China, but now you can't even you can't even think of it that way you just have to think yeah. of it as like this global event you know and 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 just hope that that uh that this kind of thing is is prevented in some way because obviously it could start anywhere it could start oh yeah uh, sure these kind of things could start anywhere I, we've learned that and so then the point is like how do we not let that happen because we see how how quickly it went I mean, it spread pretty quick, you know. Yeah, it's, it was yeah bizarre. I mean, just, luckily the mortality is not higher. You know, that yeah. would have been then even even worse. You know, I mean. Yeah, yeah. It's... Although in the United States, we've had good, the highest of, of any country, and um, oh, oh. yeah, that's what I've at least read. You know, that we have the highest deaths from it of any country oh. on the planet, and. Um, so that you know, that's a pretty big deal, and yet we also have the most bullhead, some of the most bullheaded people in this country that that still insist that there's no such thing and that it's a conspiracy and all this stuff. Oh man, know? it's in in Europe. This is even bigger. I think you know, it's like not now. Really? Yeah, it's like in Slovenia's vaccination rate at this moment is fifty percent only. So there's a lot of people that really. Yeah. You think it's, it's partially fear too? They're just afraid, or yeah. I mean, like here, here it's partially also government connected, and you know, they, they they don't like the government. The the thing is, you know, governments it's, do all kinds of things. You know, yeah. like yeah. I mean, at least in our in our country, you have to wear a seatbelt when you when you drive your car, and so you can oh, sure. say like, yeah. "What's well, my car?" Why are you forcing my body to put a seatbelt on? But it's just... It's That's the no thinking. Brain. That's the thinking. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's... There yeah. are other things like that, too. Like, they, exactly. they, this isn't the first time. Yeah. <clears throat> you, know, they, you could name quite a few things. Oh, like sure. that. I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, smoking cigarettes, it's like, it's not that you can't smoke them, but there are huge taxes on them and all kinds of stuff, and you'd... You go well. That's government, you know. Yeah. That, that's government trying to, I don't know, you know, trying to do the right thing. Not that yeah. they always do, but uh, you know. Um, yeah, it's, it's 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 a it's a funny thing. We'll, but we'll see. I, I mean, hopefully yeah. we'll, we'll swim out of it somehow soon, sooner or later. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I hope so, and I hope the world gets in, into a little bit better place. I'm not. 
Yeah. I'm not sure whether that's going to happen. Because getting back <laughs> to like when I did do this last tour in Europe, that was way before any pandemic. And just the traveling situation, I can tell you, Samo, it, it was so hard and difficult to get mm -hmm. from one place to the other. Let's say to get from Belgrade to, to Italy the next day. Oh, well. It was like entire, even though it's not that far, it was an entire like, you know, four planes and two of them were canceled and four hours at each time place waiting. I mean, in a lot of cases, we didn't get to the gig that started at eight until like seven o'clock that night. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. It happened many times. And so what it is, is, is the whole world was starting to get like overloaded, you know, with, yeah. with the whole thing of terrorism, which we still haven't come to you know any conclusion sure. with and so the, with all of that you had to wait in huge lines which you couldn't do now because the lines we waited in november i'm like neck and neck with like people for yeah, sure. i could smell like what perfume they didn't or did have on you yeah know? exactly you know what i mean yeah. it's like either way it was too close you know yeah yeah <laughs> and so um I, I just don't see how that can be done again you know, yeah. uh, so so they're going to have to be the. My point would be like less tourists traveling, but then again, the club owners and yeah, the producing events with me or any musician, they want there to be plenty of uh, sure. tourism. So uh, yeah, kind of a tough one to to uh, to to figure out. You know, yeah. I think maybe maybe too many people traveling for just pure. Um, pure kind of uh egoistic like, fun or something. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. materialistic pleasure you know like oh, yeah and, exactly. um, you know and maybe yeah. maybe a little bit less of that like how about if I some agree. of those people just stay home you know yeah <laughs> yeah explore your surroundings i mean that's what we've yeah. done here you know you become aware even more how beautiful it is where you live so that's important exactly so. yeah so i but, think that's a good thing to do yeah you know? Steve, I just wanted to ask you this, like, it was on the tip of my tongue now all the time, like, you know, talking about traveling, like, when was your first time in Europe? And, like, um, with that who was be, that? Let me see, that would be with, um, with Steve, Steve Kuhn. With the wow, Steve like, Kuhn Quartet. Motility. That, yeah. That, oh, man. The, the recording of Motility was also like a three-week tour. You know that's going way with, back with Bob and Harvey, like the same band. Or? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And and um, and th so that would be a you know, I'm in my early twenties, and um, that would be the first time I had gone to Europe. And then really, how was that like? I, well, it was great. I mean, I I loved it. I mainly I I love playing music anywhere, you know. And so yeah. um, I like you know I, I like traveling, and I I don't I really take to it well and i like being in different places i like different food yeah I like, you know and i like playing music for people so that just was a natural and then after that really my life became like half of my gigs were in europe for sure. several, yeah. several decades so it wasn't just with steve it was with a, a a number of people that followed all after that and then um probably you know the the most um I guess uh, the most um, successful band that drew like huge crowds would be the Mingus band in the nineties that I was uh, leading for a good period of time, but yeah. it didn't really matter. I mean, I was contributing arrangements and that band got to be like organically very popular without there being one star, you know, in other words, in most other cases, I would name you like one person, Ray yeah, Barrett. Sure. Sure. Ray Barreto for two years and it, it would be Ray Barreto but nobody really cared that much whether I'm playing with him although I some people did but the point being that it's a you know some of the bands would be like you know one person yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, that's drawing the the um the name but with the Mingus Big Band it was a kind of the cool thing about it is that, that it was a an organic group of like, like I said, Randy Brecker's in it, John Stubblefield. I mean, oh yeah, exactly. Pete Jackson on drums and um, uh, John Hicks on piano. So it was all guys that were, you know, pretty well known, but not, you know, but all part of this this band 
that became pretty popular and that that would be all during the 90s yeah. and uh, so really from the period that i um first came with steve kuhn which would be 1978 i think or 70, wow. 78 um yeah, so, so back <laughs> far enough for me to not quite remember but no i do remember um the experiences were great and and nothing about it was um felt unusual to me in any way like um because it's all about the music you know yeah. and and so that in that in that sense i'd have to say in my life there's no place i haven't liked being because i'm always there to play music and so sure. i can't ever think of any place even some places that were not exactly tourist spots like liverpool England. <laughs> Even though you know it's famous, yeah, okay, know, yeah, sure, sure. It's a shitty ass town, you know, kind of like a lot of American towns are are shitty too. You know, to to be honest with you, you know, they, there's a lot of great towns where great musicians have come from, like Indianapolis or or um, Cleveland or uh, uh, even Detroit to a certain aspect, you know, and and yet they're not exactly tourist tourist towns. Spots, you know, yeah on the on the map for and and for instance liverpool really sucks and i wouldn't know it and in other words if i just read like accounts of of it i would think oh this cool town where like the, this group you know this rock group came from but i i can tell you i still remember like how like you couldn't even get a meal there like you know because of the restaurants were so bad you know and yet i loved playing there you know sure so, yeah so uh it doesn't really matter whether it's a tourist spot. I mean, of course, it helps in Switzerland. I mean, anybody should be able to to be able to enjoy what a country like Switzerland has yeah. to offer. Sure. Um, and unfortunately, if you're not wealthy enough, you can't just fly there on your own. And so, I'm you know, I'm thankful that music has enabled me to see places like that, that that are absolutely gorgeous you know yeah irregardless of music but i have to say that i i don't necessarily enjoy playing music at them any better or worse sure yeah, yeah. so it's just I the whole touring experience like you know when, when you when i make a tour and you send the tour schedule to the musicians and then they right. see like four dates in italy let's say yeah yeah everyone is like yeah you know, yeah yeah, we're gonna play. I don't know Ferrara and Firenze. So yeah, like, yeah. It's like, yeah, man. Okay. Yeah, I mean, but I'll tell you what, man. Eastern Europe. I, I went. That's one thing I said last in the November when we were there. I, I really think it's 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 the the new, somewhat um, uh, uncharted. Not uncharted, mm -hmm. but in other words, it's 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 the new gold mine to me. For hungry our, people for yeah. our music by our music i mean improvised jazz and modern uh, contemporary um music because the audiences are great you know yeah. uh mm -hmm. and, and they love they love the music and they have big old theaters that are great for for um you know maybe they've had classical music a little bit mm -hmm. more but they, they've also supported jazz even during the worst of times. I mean, Definitely. Um, yeah, yeah. you know, um, people don't realize that, but because like you say, it's not the, it's not the one that was on your, on your um, roadmap that you said, Oh, I can't wait to be there. But I'm I, you know, like, look, my wife is from Bulgaria, you know, I really, so, oh, well. yeah. Well, my wife is born and raised and grew up under communism in Bulgaria. Yeah. So my daughters are all half Bulgarian and, um, Bulgaria is a fantastic country. Yeah, right? sure. And has a fantastic musical um, history too that's not <laughs> at all anything like any other country. Um, and really, I think that's true of every country, you know. They, um, some maybe a little more than others. Some some maybe have a little stronger personality that way or, or yeah. are a little bit more funky than others. Um, but... Um, uh, I guess I'm I'm prejudiced because I I like Bulgaria, but I've learned to like almost all of the countries in the surrounding so-called, um, you know, Northern European or what, the Balkans, whatever whatever you want to call yeah, it. Sure. Um, uh, it's not it's not considered Western Europe in in a certain way. 
um, all these things like categories like that are all stupid because uh, I don't know what you mean, like the former Eastern Bloc kind of yeah. The, East, the former yeah. Eastern Bloc and all Let's that. Let's put it like that, yeah. And they're all they all have their own personality. And and yeah. when it was called Eastern Bloc, that took the personality away by by just the general world, you know. Yeah. Not, not those that were hip enough to know, but um I was young enough to be at that time to just be a victim of it. Oh, that's the Eastern Bloc, and just think of it as this kind of thing. I'm talking about when I was like 16 or something, you know, because that's how our schools taught. And I've learned that that you know that each country has its own definite personality and and beautiful culture. But the one thing in common is that they all seem to like like our music, you know. Definitely, man. Yeah, you know? and yeah. they're not necessarily as pop oriented, even as the United States is. You know, I mean, everywhere is pop and rock oriented, but maybe to the degree that, that the United States is, some other countries are a little bit hipper, I think, in yeah. in, in recognizing, you know, true true art and music compared to like bubblegum pop, you know. <laughs> it's still jazz, you know, what you guys played and still do, you know, like the, Dave Liebman told me he came to Yugoslavia in 1971, for instance. Exactly. And people just, you know, ate. They loved the music. They loved it, you know, or like Barry also was here in, he said like in 65, I think, you know, that's incredible. And people loved it. It was like still the socialist communist bloc, Yugoslavia and everything, but people just like the cities were great. I mean, the the, the capital of Yugoslavia was like a fantastic city to go to, you know, and I remember that clearly also. You know, before they start changing names and divisions and yeah. everything, you know. Um, but yeah, I I remember that for sure. Also, you know, maybe not quite as early as those guys, but yeah, you know, we, we went there pretty. I mean, um, Czechoslovakia and U- Yugoslavia were both places that were. You'd mainly go to the two bigger cities in each. Yeah, other. sure. Zagreb, Ljubljana, probably Belgrade, Belgrade. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You know, it's beautiful. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I just wanted to ask you, like before, already we mentioned we mentioned Joe, and uh, I wanted to ask you about your. You know, I've spoken to so many of your uh, your generation, around your generation. You know, uh, Joe and Bob Mincer and Dave Liebman, and I, I did this talk with Billy Drews, like, uh, like all this generation of players who. You know, you started kind of late 70s, mid 70s. And uh, it's incredible if you add like Michael Brecker there also and, you know, mm-hmm. Steve, Steve Grossman and all these amazing players. Right. Yeah. And uh, Joe Lovano, I guess also around that time, I wanted to ask you how did like this camaraderie between the saxophone players exist then in the late 70s? And how did your story with Joe begin back then already? Or it's it's, it's thanks to uh, Berkeley College of Music, which was really a small little college then. In other words, now it's this huge, like thousands of, you know, there's two thousand guitar players alone there, or whatever. You know? Oh yeah, sure, yeah. But like, at least, but the point being, like Joe and I are the same age, or within the same a- age. Um, uh, and and we all found ourselves in Boston at the same time. Billy Drews, you know, we're all from different places, so we may not have met at such a young age if it wasn't for yeah. Berkeley. And um, uh, so that that's like the phenomenal the, the the phenomena of Berkeley, which now is a different thing. If you talk to a younger person going there now, it's like, well, of course, because it's this huge institution right at that time it was just one building and the wow. building <laughs> wow. the building i think had four floors and a basement and so maybe 400 people at the most if i'm going to guess like 400 total you know and so maybe 40 or less teachers you know and now there's like you know like i said there's 200 just guitar teachers, teachers. yeah yeah sure it's- you know? So the Correct. point being, like, when we went there, it was a small, a little bit more purely jazz school in the sense they didn't offer um, electronic music or, or 
anything that was rock oriented or pop oriented um, at that time. And they do now. And, and I think that's fine, you know, um, but the point is they didn't then. And so it was a kind of a more concentrated uh, group of people with the, all the people that you mentioned. Now, some of them d didn't go there, you know, Bob Menser didn't and yeah. Dave Lehman's a little older. So he was already born and raised in new york and the guys that were born and raised in new york that's that's kind of a different subject bob berg oh yeah um, oh shit. Steve, bob berg. steve grossman steve grossman yeah. the, those guys you know bob and i were the same age and bob oh, left, i mean he he, yeah. he left he left way too soon but i didn't meet him until i came to new york because and dave lehman also because they were all those guys were blessed with like my two daughters were born in new york city so yeah. they, they have a they have a head start in that sense, um, and so those those of us that weren't born in New York City, we met in Boston, you know, and um, a few a few exceptions. I mean, some guys went to the only other school you could go to was uh, North Texas University or Indiana, mm. and uh, Mike Recker went to Indiana, and so you know, um, some of us we didn't meet till we got to New York, but. Um, <laughs> With the guy, the first few guys you mentioned, we met in we met in Boston, and we became really close friends close. Be before we moved to New York, and did a, get, did a quite a few gigs and stuff to, together in Boston. But we didn't really formulate all of our theories until we came to New York. <laughs> until we came to New York, you know, <laughs> that that's uh, that's one phrase. Um, Dave Stryker that's told me true. like one time, you know, my friend Dave Stryker. Yeah, he said one time he was sitting in at a club in Harlem. This is like 25 years ago. And uh, George Benson walked in. And of course, George Benson's already famous and known, made a lot of records. And so he comes up to Dave and he goes, man, I like your theories. That's what he said. <laughs> and I thought, I thought that, you know, it's been, you know, you can say, man, I really like your, your, your playing, you know, or I like, I like to hear how you play the blues, but I, when you say like I like your theories, that shows yeah. somebody that's really listening. Yeah, to me, that's somebody because you're listening beyond like even the just the external into like the deeper ideas of that we all have our own theories in a way. If we do have our own sounds, they, they come from. I mean, theory is a is a scientific word, word mm -hmm. but let's face it. I'm, I mean, mathematics and music. I'm not a math person. My wife is, uh, coincidentally. I'm the music person. She's the math person. But, like, you know, theories are a part of both of our, um, you know, both of our worlds. It's just mine is more on the creative, yeah. purely creative side. But I do think Albert Einstein was probably pretty creative, too. I didn't know him, but uh, <laughs> I imagine those highest level guys are pretty pretty much dealt in the in in the realm of creativity too no, which is what, what we're what we're dealing with with music in other words i i get an inspiration and that's just the start of a of a theory that then becomes a song and then the song is like you know e equals mc squared once it's finished you can't change it you know there's nothing in it that you would change it's a form not a formula but it's a it's something that you've you've codified and 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 yeah that's it you know like you, you you're really not going to change change it you know that's that's one thing i was um you know arguing with my wife about um my daughter the oldest one is like applying for colleges and she has to write essays to mm -hmm. apply to yeah. college and she's constantly trying to change the essay that she wrote and i said i said to my wife you know at a certain point you just have to say this is let it go yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah. And this finished flaws and everything, you know, um, because otherwise you can, you can spend your whole life trying to polish something up. And actually that's not the best because the Lonious Monk taught us that, that some of the best compositions are, are things that, that sound like they were written real um, uh, spontaneously, even if they weren't, yeah, even if they, weren't yeah. they, they sound like they were, you know, yeah. And so that's part of the vocabulary of writing, writing well. I think for either in words or in music, is that it it sounds like it was very extemporaneous, even if it wasn't. You yeah, know? yeah. And, and so that I think that's a, 
one of the secrets, you know, to try to get to, you know, to, to, to this thing. Yeah. 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 Steve, I just wanted to ask you, like, writing songs and leading bands. I listened to the other day to this record you did. I don't know if that's official. High Standards with Mike Stern. Uh-huh. And uh, that's really like, the first record that I made. With, uh, the, how did that one happen? Like, uh, um, It was just, um, we, um, that, that was Japan, Polydor Japan put out my very first record. And it was... Um, they they knew me from Carla Blaze band, so they they were willing to have it just come out under my name. But the thing is, we at that time we had a collaborative group where we you know kind of were. It wasn't really just Steve Slagle group. It was me and Mike Victor Mike. Lewis, who's one of my favorite drummers, Harvey S again, Harvey, yeah. and um, a, a pianist named Ted Saunders, who now lives in Los Angeles. And so when we played together, it wasn't like one leader's name, but mm. Japan gave me. Um, through Carla Blay gave me the opportunity to put a record out. So I put it out under everyone's name. And that's a long time ago. To be honest with you, I, I don't listen to any of that. Man, but I, I listen, moments notice on that one. You're you're killing it on that one, seriously. Like, well, thank you. But, it's but like, you know, I, I did play that song with McCoy Tyner. And, and so, really? Oh, man. And I, yeah, oh. just at a rehearsal. We never played it live because he, oh, wow. he, he didn't want to play it. But at the first rehearsal, first and only rehearsal that I did with him, we did play it. And so much more in my memory is is playing that with McCoy Tyner, you know, and um, I wouldn't really even want to listen to because I felt like with McCoy that I was further along because this was only a couple four or so years ago and I was much further along in my own playing, even though playing with him was kind of, um, uh, you know, a big thrill and, 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 um, uh, you know, a, a great um, experience, and it was really yeah, nice, yeah. you know, to to be able to be play in his quartet even for like the uh, year and a half or so, and and only a handful of gigs, most of them in New York City, but a few of them outside and uh, traveling, and and um, uh, we did do one recording in the studio um, that I don't know if it'll be released or not. Oh man, his family, but. Um, uh that to me is something that I, I don't really think about the record you mentioned because oh, that's yeah. kind of like that's kind of like if if you look at a picture of yourself like when you were you know 30 years ago you'll just go like it it's so old that that um you'll be like man I don't own that shirt I don't own that saxophone I yeah, don't yeah, have, sure. I don't sure, own that analogy. hair uh, I don't have that hair anymore I don't have you know <laughs> and it, it's just I I don't know, I know what just, you mean there's yeah. something about music that that in some ways it is like a, a picture in the sense of like you snap a picture well that's the, the, what jazz is and so I don't look at old old pictures of myself you know um, no sure Makes you know, I, unless someone says, look at this picture, and then I'll go, oh, wow, or my kids will go like, look, at you had a mustache. You look so ugly with that mustache, you know, or whatever. <laughs> and I, I won't even remember. But, you know, the, playing with McCoy was a, was a great experience. Even How did it happen, was, by the way? Like that game? Uh, well, through Gerald Cannon, who I used on the record with Dave, um, Dave Stryker, the last record I did with Dave Stryker, we, it's called Roots, and, yeah. and Gerald is... Um, um, uh, I asked to be, play bass on that record and so from the friendship that we developed then he then kind of was he was acting as musical director for McCoy for oh, about, okay. ten, about 10 years I didn't know he got, he got yeah he got quite a few guys on the band before me um, Joe Lovano was one of them and um, and so I'm at more the tail end um, and um, McCoy at first the first six months was was in fairly good health but then it really started deteriorating and unfortunately that's what i had to experience but as a person he was always really um uh warm and and um yeah. nice to be around at first the first six months he, he his playing was and then it got you know i think he had another stroke and he got um kind of worse and worse and 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 unfortunately that you know that's how it ended but i i guess i would be one of the last people to play in in his quartet and yeah. working 
quartet. And um, I'm really glad for that opportunity. And so when you mention Moments Snows to me, that's what I think, you know. Oh, yeah. um, and the other songs we played, other than that, we didn't play any Coltrane songs. We played all his songs. What, all was, what was the first song you guys, you remember you played together? I, I fly like with the, the first wind. time. Oh, okay. Fly with the wind because he wow. he really liked he really liked that song. I I think he people told him that was his most um, well known song. I mean mm -hmm. I don't know who told him that, but I, maybe he felt it too. Like he liked it. It had a lot. It has a lot of interesting parts to it, and mm -hmm. it's real burning, you know. Um, and we would play Parasina from the um, record uh, uh, that he made for Blue Note. And uh, sometimes backstage, I would play a song of his, and he'd go like, he'd he'd go like, I know that song. Oh and man! I'd go, oh. I'd go like, Well, you wrote it, and and he would kind of get confused and go like, Man, I can't even remember all the songs I wrote, you know. And he told me honestly that sometimes he would write a song for a recording that I, me or Joe Lovano or somebody like grew up listening to, and he himself wouldn't play it that much again you know yeah. um and that was true with duke ellington too i was told that since i didn't meet duke ellington but through Britt woodman the trombonist with duke he told me the same thing he told me that many of the songs that we all um by that i mean the younger generations that came know of as these fantastic duke and billy strayhorn songs you know whether they were collaborative or it's separate he said the band would hardly ever play them. Mm. So um, that was McCoy interesting. Told the, McCoy told me the same thing. Um, so so that was that was interesting to me. Um, so he had a, a, a group of four or five, six songs that he would play at, towards the end. What blues on the corner we would play yeah, every right. night. You know, and that's a hard hard song to play because sometimes he would play it fast and it's a hard melody to play yeah. on size phone. You know. But um, that that was just a great experience. It's one of those things that I'm I'm forever grateful for, and um, yeah, uh, can imagine, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just Steve, just one last thing, not to take too much of your time. But I just you mentioned Carla Blay, and I listened to the other day to Ballad of the Fallen, and uh -huh. you know it has Dewey on it, who's one of my heroes, and Paul Motion, who's one of my and Mick Goodrick and Don Cherry, and like yeah, how, yeah, yeah. How, how how was that experience for you like since you know well, it was great because also it led to me having a friendship with dewey you know in other words really yeah wow. before that uh, I, recording i didn't i didn't know wow. dewey and, and so then we we did, we did a tour and a recording and that was over a period of about six months right so wow. then we discovered me and dewey both lived within a mile or two of each other in brooklyn i was living in brooklyn and he was too so he would come over and uh, after that recording was made, we stayed friends to the rest of his life, you know. Oh, wow. Um, oh, wow. He, we would um, get together. He'd sometimes bring his alto over because he liked playing alto, you know. And um, so he'd sometimes bring the alto over and we'd just jam with bass player Ed Schuller, who lived in the building, yeah. and Steve Johns, who played drums. And, and so we would oh. just, on a, on a day like today, we would just jam uh and um i got to know him pretty well you know in the sense of like his sense of humor besides even his music he was a really really interestingly funny personality you know very very unique you know um a lot of people don't know that of of him and some guys like him that they had such a, a, a outlook on the world and such a sense of humor that they were as funny as the stand-up comedians that you see right now, like, you know, that are popular because they had that same sense of humor. And so Dewey would just crack me up. He was just really hilarious. And I was influenced by um, his, um, his sense of freedom in music is something that um, yeah. I feel like th that if I was going to say like who who um, was the, one of the key figures that to me in, in, in freedom within music on the saxophone, who, who was my mentor in mm -hmm. the sense, even though that isn't what 
I mean, we played together like like we were uh, equals, but um, I certainly wasn't, uh, you know, of, of, of the experience with him of playing with like Keith and playing with Ornette. And I talked to him about I talked to him about both of those. Oh, really? Like, he, he did tell yeah, stories. He I mean, great, like, great stories. Yeah. Really? Oh wow. Yeah, and so you know, um, but I, but I studied like right standing next to him, like how he would play through changes. You know, yeah, like that's amazing. Man. And um, so or not changes. You know how he would make up changes when there weren't changes, and and the key component with that was also Charlie Hayden, who who. Um, him and Dewey, who him and Dewey and Paul were, and Don were extremely tight, and you you couldn't get in between that. In other words, I I wasn't part I wasn't part of that, like you know that quartet of of, of tightness, you know, uh, but I was close enough to smell it. And, 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 <laughs> yeah. and with Dewey and with Paul, I got to be close close with Paul in some ways too but also, Dewey, well, we, we lived we were somewhat neighbors you know and uh, I mean he, he lived in bed and I lived in Fort Greene and and mm. in Brooklyn that's only a couple miles away like a couple subway stops right and so um we got to be really good friends and I knew his his wife she was from uh somewhere like Czechoslovakia or yeah, yeah I think yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, do you remember what country she's still around she might have gone back but i think she's still living in his apartment in brooklyn but she's from northern europe uh, somewhere and um i should remember where but it's been a while since i've seen her and so you know um that that to answer your question the recording was was fine and and the tour tour was fine but becoming friends for life really with Dewey till the end of his life um, was the biggest biggest thing for me. If you if you asked me to trade any of it for that, I would say that one thing would be the friendship. You know, the record's fine and it it, it does seem to be like one that a lot of people like. Yeah. It was just <clears throat> made in two days. Um, some of the live gigs were way better. Um, I can say that much. Sure. Um, some of them weren't. We did quite a few, you know, during that tour, and then in the states here too. Um, some of the best of the live gigs were were way better than that record, but I'd say that record's about in the fifty percent, like it's at least, you know, in in the middle of 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 as good. There were times that that um, Charlie was still having problems, and and um, yeah. um, that that interfered at, at times. Uh, uh, but Carla, the thing about Carla is, see, I learned um, orchestration and arrangement from her in, in the sense that, like, I would hear how she would take, Charlie would send her, like, a, a, a 16 bar <laughs> and pen, pencil, like, you know, um, folk song that he found uh, oh, wow. from, from somewhere in South America. And I saw what he sent her. It would be like a pencil 16 bar. Um, <laughs> but little melody right mm -hmm. she turned it into a whole opus you know a whole like hugely orchestrated with all kinds of added parts colors and, yeah. yeah just incredible orchestration and arrangement orchestration i'd also say because she could take a melody and orchestrate it in ways that made the melody like way more than it even originally was i mean unless yeah. it was just one guy in the street singing it but in this case, it wasn't that. It was, a, you know, you know, twelve people, and so she, you know, blew it up to to proportions that um, that were magnificent, you know. And I saw mm -hmm. her do that with her own band too, because I played with her own band yeah. for yeah. about four records, and she did that with everything that she touched, you know. And she took her time too. She she's one of the first people that I met that um, was a true composer in the sense of like, she'd wake up in the morning, have coffee and start writing. You know, she never practiced. In other words, I, I'll wake up and I'll maybe start practicing along with writing, but she didn't ever practice. I mean, she admitted, you know, that she, ne she didn't know what, what it was to practice because she didn't ever think of music that way. Just yeah. like I, some classical composers were like that, you know, 
most jazz composers were not like that, but <laughs> some some cla some really good classical composers weren't necessarily like um, you know masters of their instrument. Yeah. You know, they just had incredible ears and incredible talent for for that composition, arrangement, orchestration. You know, and she's like that. So so I learned that there's such a person as that 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 I'm just not reading about in a book. That I'm seeing that they actually wake up every day and do it. So. The point being, like, she would take this this thing that, let's say, someone would send her, like Charlie, and it wouldn't be just in a day that she would do this. This would be over a period of a, a, quite a, a quite Weeks. a period of time, yeah, and and it would develop and 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 um, you know become something completely different. And so I, I've learned I've learned from that. In fact, the Mingus arrangements that I did yeah. were based on based on how I saw her do things and all of those arrangements I did for the Mingus Big Man all took me a while. Like none of them came sure. like in, in one, I'm not, I'm not necessarily a, a, a commercial arranger in that like, I, I, I don't know if I can just take um, something and in one day, it, I mean, it, it wouldn't satisfy me to do yeah. that. Like some, someone might like it for their, for their college band or something. But for me, I always tried to with the Mingus, um, compositions I always tried to say okay this composition is really well known how can I arrange it in a way that no one else has done you know yeah. not just repeat like like an arrangement that's already been done or, or one that's uh, recorded or one that he did even um, I would try to rehash it in my mind and think of a way that I could do it differently you know uh, not, not necessarily differently but at least uniquely and um uh, Britt, Woodman, yeah. Britt Woodman gave me the greatest compliment, which God bless him because he's no longer here, but he played with Mingus and Duke. And at one time in the 90s, he said he, he was very sparse with his compliments. He was a tough kind of guy who went through a lot of stuff in his life with race and things. Sure. And he was even distrustful of white people a little bit, I think, if I might say that. Um, and he very quietly once said to me, he said, you know, I think uh, Charles would, would like your arrangements uh, as much as anybody that's doing this stuff for him right now. Because he said, I think you're keyed into how he would have liked to have someone mm -hmm. arrange his music. And that to me was a greater compliment than Downbeat Magazine could give oh, sure, man. five <laughs> stars to or whatever, you know. That's 5,000 stars to me. And I'll, I'll remember because I didn't ever coax it out of him i didn't say how do you like my arrangements you know because <laughs> i he wasn't that kind of guy you you didn't really he was a like i say he was kind of a look he went through duke's band and mingus's band and um he was the lead trombonist and he was quite adept at what he did and and didn't get all the um um do he didn't get all the respect and all the calculations that he should have and so you know he he, he was, I'm, I'm glad I, again, he's another guy up there to, to, with McCoy to me, I, as far as on his instrument, because as a lead trombone player to play with Duke and Mingus, I mean, you yeah. couldn't, I don't think there's anyone else you could name. Maybe Jimmy Nepper, but Jimmy Nepper didn't Nepper, play with Duke. Yeah. Duke. Yeah. So anyhow, um, Britt Woodman was, uh, and so when I did that song, I remember Britt on Nascentia, mm -hmm. I thought, I thought that my um, that he had written it for Britt Woodman, but it turns out he didn't, you know. Oh, but okay. uh, I thought that Harold Mayburn, see, Harold Mayburn had passed by the time I did that record. But you, you played with Harold also in the past? You did probably. No, no, I no, just never. knew him, but um, oh, Jeremy okay. Pell played with him. And so Jeremy, oh, yeah, told exactly. me, yeah. Jeremy told me when I said I want to do that record, that song, Jeremy said, well, you know, he wrote that for Britt Woodman. And I said, no, you're kidding. Uh, because uh, Jeremy didn't know how well I knew Britt. But it turns out th that Jeremy wasn't correct about that. But he actually, Jeremy actually thought that too. So it's not like it was a dumb thing to think. Sure, sure. Um, it's a beautiful song in tribute. It turns on, it's in tribute to a young, um, a young girl who passed away that Britt knew that was a, friend of a friend of his family so uh -huh. it turns out that that that's the truth and her name was Britt but it's not really well known 
Um, I, it took me a while to find that. In fact, it was a radio broadcaster in somewhere in Europe that contacted me and said, do you know that Britt didn't write that? Uh, he, I mean, that Harold didn't yeah. write that for Britt Woodman. And I said, no, really tell me. And, I, and so I found out the story. But um, when I recorded it, I actually thought it was for Britt Woodman. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> which still, is, that's, the, which is okay. nice. Okay. Still, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, it's a beautiful cool. song. You know. Very beautiful. Yeah, cool. Thank you, Steve. I, I will not take, I have many well, other I questions, but hold. we thank haven't touched. You, <laughs> Doctor Jazz.